one with you. Okay. Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the uh, St. Croix Central Board of Education meeting for Monday, January 28th. Mm -hmm. I uh, thank everybody here on this frigid night. <laughs> A little surprised we have this many people here. It should have stayed home and stayed warm. <laughs> Call the meeting to order. Uh, first order, if everybody would rise for the Pledge of Allegiance, please. <laughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay, uh, roll call. Uh, Mr. DeGros won't be with us tonight. All other members are present. Was the meeting properly notified? Yes, it was. Okay, this at this time we have opportunity for public comment, and uh, at this time uh, we had a request uh, from Susan Rochelle. So, welcome. Thank you for having me. Um, so I just have a statement to make to the Office of the Sergeant. Sure. I spoke to do with a copy of it. And then I do have the research that I referred to here okay. as well. Okay. I was wondering if you could speak into the microphone. Oh, absolutely. Okay. Good evening. I would like to thank the board for your time and service. My name is Susan Rochelle. I am a mother of a student in the Gifted and Talented Program within the St. Croix Central Middle School. I am also a speech language pathologist and work primarily with the pediatric population. I am in a position to work both professionally and privately where I find myself accommodating the needs, learning needs of children across the spectrum of the infamous bell curve. I make mention of the bell curve because of its significance in identifying and qualifying children in both special education and gifted and talented. We use it to identify the kids on the fringe. It is my belief that these children, like all, are different, not less. According to Public Law 91-230, Section 806, as a district, we are obligated to meet the needs of both populations. And I have no doubt that all in attendance tonight value and seek to meet these obligations. Our daughter, Sydney, was identified as exceptional and placed in the Gifted and Talented program in the third grade. She's currently in seventh grade. From the initial testing until today, outsiders have advised we seek private education in order to accommodate her needs and maximize her potential. Their concerns are valid, not just for Sydney, but for her GT peers as well. However, I have chosen to work closely with faculty over the years. I have demonstrated faith in the development of our GT program and, program, and I'm here tonight demonstrating faith in this district to take further action. Historically, the needs of the GT population far outweigh the time dedicated to them. I'm asking for action to be taken to better service and ensure that results equal the intentions, because I believe the intentions are there. I'm also suggesting that the least restrictive environment for the GT population isn't necessarily 100% regular ed classrooms. I propose that SCC hire a qualified full-time faculty member to meet the academic and social-emotional needs of the 20-plus middle school GT students. This would allow for maximum support within the middle school setting. I don't make this proposal lightly as our family has three and a half years of GT programming under our belt. And we have consistently seen action not meeting intention, though to no fault of any one individual. According to Cross, this research in 2014, social cognition is often high in the GT population. Unfortunately, this can result in increased efforts made by these students to blend in academically with peers in the regular education classrooms. Now, blending in isn't necessarily a poor choice or negative. However, not admitting, admitting one's true ability, avoiding volunteering to answer questions, downplaying their accomplishments, and asking questions they already know the answers to are quite negative and self-limiting. Some GT students go so far as to identify with the GT label entirely. 
Consistent exposure to learning environments where the zone of proximal development is presented below their ability increases the frequency, frequency in which GT students' reactions result in disidentification of self and reduced learner outcomes. I am proposing an equity-based increase in the staffing for the GT population. Earlier, I referred to the zone of proximal development, meaning the sweet spot for learning. Where enough of a challenge is consistently provided to a learner, requiring qualified outside support to successfully acquire the content. Of further importance in this scenario is the need for the social interactions that allow the learner to observe and practice their skills. While this concept is applicable for all learners across all contexts, in 2015, Coleman and colleagues consolidated 25 years of research in the GT population to provide us with specific direction. They identified the top four challenges GT students face within a typical classroom, and of no surprise, they included waiting for others, not being challenged, academic resistance, and even bullying and outwardly advocating for their needs. The faculty of SCC makes great efforts to meet the needs of the GT students through professional development and differentiation of curriculum. Unfortunately, as confirmed by current research, it is unreasonable to assume that these efforts are sufficient in the classroom of today. At this point, it's worth noting that Coleman and colleagues also found the common advantage reported by GT students was their access to specialized programming. In our district, this access is currently limited due to time constraints of faculty. I see this as an opportunity to invest in a GT classroom. It would be within this classroom environment that the academic and social emotional needs of the students could be further met with greater consistency yielding better learner outcomes. GT students could offset the stigma of their label, learn within their zone of proximal development, and more often be surrounded by peers of like mind and neural functioning. I suggest we empower these students to realize their self-identity and full ability to contribute to society by improving their learning environment. Our response to these insights should be action. In 2017, Callahan and colleagues call for such action in their research, wherein they outline the critical components to ensuring we, as a district committed to increasing potential, can increase the effectiveness and longevity of our GT programming. Firstly, they cited the need for quality faculty. SCC has accomplished this in obtaining a quality teacher, just not in quantity, as his time allotted to GT programming is far lacking. Secondly, there needs to be protocol in place for identification of giftedness via qualified professionals. This too is occurring at SCC, and it appears that last year was dedicated to the refinement of this process. Thirdly, programming needs to be ensured that student learner outcomes from both general curriculum and GT programming will provide maximum results. And doesn't this tie into the goal of public education? School is meant to increase the potential and the performance of all students, no matter their placement on that infamous bell curve. Again, I am proposing equity of services for GT programming in the least restrictive environment. In conclusion, I would again like to thank the board and those in attendance for your time this evening. I am grateful for the program the faculty has developed and its implementing of the program to the best of their ability. I am here tonight simply shining a light on what I perceive as their biggest obstacle, and that's time. It is my hope that our 2019-2020 budget will include a full-time, qualified faculty member dedicated to meeting the needs of our GT population. It is my hope that I've provided adequate research to validate my proposal, and that, as a respected district, we can take up appropriate action to meet the needs of all students without exception due to their exceptionality. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, questions, statements? Okay, I can start. Um, so 
about this time each year, this, the administrative team starts with a staffing wish list, is what we call it, and we start developing a list, of course, and then based on funding, as, as we get closer to finding out what our budget is, we make those decisions. And we've been fortunate the last two years to be able to add staff. Um, but again, it's priorities, and, right? Uh, priorities are kind of in the eye of the beholder, so to speak. So uh, we make team decisions and we make recommendations to the board. So um, last year, a full-time GT coach was on the list and didn't make it. It is, again, on the list of okay. 14. Um, again, it's, it's part of our discussion. Um, so your, your timing is good. Um, but um, like I said, there are 14 right now on the list, um, and so we've recognized the need as well. But um, I thought uh, your comments and statements were very appropriate and helpful, so thank you. Yeah, if I could speak a little bit on, on behalf of the, the schools, this would also be a good time to lobby your state legislators. As you stated, uh, this is mandated by state statute. However, they have only deemed uh, a little over $237,000 to fund this program for 421 school districts across the state. Now that isn't very much money. And um, it's frustrating, I know, for members of the board to know the needs of the students and not be able to provide it. And you, know, you, you talk a little bit about a bell curve. Uh, I very much dislike bell curves. And I think most of us here dislike that. We're, we're looking to commit to allow the students to achieve the maximum of their potential and provide the resources that are available uh, to do that. And so. We're in a struggle of budgetary things, but you know we're going to try our best in the priority list um, to do so. Um, this is a budget year at the state level, and I would very much encourage anybody here to lobby your state legislators. Um, Patty Schachner, who's our state senator, would be a good one to uh, get since she's on the education committee for the state senate. Um, Shannon Zimmerman, who's the rep for um, the 30th district, which is the western side of our district, is also a good one to lobby because he's on the, the Joint Finance Committee, which is essentially the Ways and Means. Okay. So they they judge the thing. Um, and there are others um, in there. But I would very much get a hold of these people and relay your concerns because your concerns are very valid. I appreciate you coming in tonight because um, it's a concern of ours also. And we will try our best um, to fund it, but uh, at this point, we have to look at the priorities in the district and we'll judge from there. So, but thank you very much for coming in. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Tim, when we have that discussion, can you just, because I think we were talking specifically about middle school. Can you just help us kind of know the metrics across all the elementary, middle school, high school? Sure. So that when we're not having it, we, you know, we've, we've done that with other positions, so we know what the coverage is. The numbers is and needs. And, yeah. yeah. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Okay. Any other? Just one clarification. Um, the 20 at the middle school, is that like 20 overall, do you know? Or is it, maybe Pete could speak to that, or is it 20 in Sydney's class? It's 20 in the um, middle school. There are five. Three green. There are five in the elementary, and according to best practice, they're currently identified in the fourth grade. And so I would assume that that would continue to be pretty consistent, but they're going to continue to come into the middle school. And that's why I was proposing that we focus on the middle school. Because I think that came in, or whoever takes this position and has the alt ed and then the elementary. Does that make sense? Yes, I just was wondering that number if it was like Sydney's grade level or the overall. Like, and I want to clarify too that I don't feel like I'm even here advocating for my daughter because it's too late. That she will be going into the high school after one more year. And I respect that at that point she has to take the bull by the horns and she gets to decide what her academic um, 
approach the schedule yeah. looks like, what challenges she faced for herself, and I think that's that's fair. So I'm really here talking for the kids that are coming behind her, because I do see that in the net. And back to the bell curve, it's not my favorite thing in the world either. <laughs> it is part of my job every day, but I do feel like every kid deserves just as much put into them so that they can make strides on that bell curve, even if they're in the top. Thank you. Thank you for coming in. Okay, is there anybody else that would have public comment at this time? Okay, hearing none, then we will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is our highlight on youth, which is a Veterans Day essay read, the middle school student Claire uh, Amir. Saying that right? So. Uh, I'm Mrs. Spockle, and I would love to introduce Claire Pamier. This is my eighth grade student whose essay that she wrote for my class this year uh, was chosen as our local winner, as well as the regional winner for the DSW out of Richmond. Uh, she was awarded last week in New Richmond yeah. a cash prize for her writing. And anyway, she read this essay at our, our, at our Veterans Day program this fall. But I thought it might be kind of fun for you to hear tonight. Okay. So, Claire, the podium's adjustable if you'd okay. like. Yeah. I mean, there's a, there's the a whole switch. switch. There's an electric switch on the right corner. If you'd like to go up or down or wherever you're. Fancy. Where's <laughs> this in my bowl? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Thank the words come naturally as the Pledge of Allegiance is engraved in my heart. I pledge allegiance to this flag, allegiance to this flag, and this flag itself is what matters to me. It does not deserve a blank stare or a robotic memorization. This flag deserves everything that I have in me, and then some more, because this flag means something. The stripes, they aren't just a pattern of red and white fabric, because each Bread in the closely woven material represents a hero, or a memory, or a life that has been forever changed. A soul who fought for us so that we may be free. Each stripe represents a barrier, an obstacle that someone had to conquer. The red is blood. Even though we are not currently in a world war or a bloodshed for independence, the blood is still there. Blood can be sacrificed, but it can also be healing. Because the power of my blood in my hold on. The, the power of blood in my veins keeps me alive, and the blood of our country is just as important because it keeps me free. Each star on the American flag reminds me of a hero. So many stars, but each is just as important as the other. What if someone took just one star off of our flag? What would happen if we did not include each and every one of our heroes? Each hero is represented in a white star. White appears numerous times on the symbol of our country as well. Peace, purity, and prosperity. White is the white dove hovering over our country when we are celebrating times of prosperity. White is people no longer experiencing the harsh pain of slavery. We have enjoyed pure freedom as people, and that is not something to be taken lightly. White is powerful, and white is everything. The immense power and depth behind each piece of cloth in our great flag is so much greater than mere cotton fabric woven together. Honor, sacrifice, life, and freedom. When I stand for the Pledge of Allegiance each and every morning, I pray I will never forget what this country means to me, liberty and justice for all. Thank you. <laughs> Questions for Claire. Just congratulations. Wonderful. Very well done. That was cool. That was excellent. Thank you. So I really appreciate that. And it's one of the highlights of our board meetings is when we can get our students before us and show us the accomplishments that they have made. So, so thank you for the presentation and uh, coming out on uh, such a cold day. <laughs> so. If, you won the regional contest. Is there? Does it go further beyond that? 
she won the district and placed second, uh, or she won the So first. I won the post in New Richmond, and then out of like the 32 posts that went into the region, I got second. So I don't think I move on beyond that, but it was still incredible. Yeah, it is. Quite an accomplishment. Yeah, I'm to see the one that won it because that's, <laughs> that's incredible writing, seriously. Thank you. I had to hear it again. What was your process in writing? Did you, how did you get the idea? How many drafts did you go? Knowing that you probably worked with Mrs. Bothell, there's more than one draft. But what was, what was your writing process? Some of the highlights of it, maybe. I don't know. I guess I didn't really have an exact way. I, for some of this, it's not very down to the rules, like, you know, it probably should be, I guess. <laughs> but um, it started out, you know, messy on paper, and then Mrs. Buckle was um, brave enough to type it into um, a Google Doc, which was probably quite the task, you know. But I don't know, it came together pretty quickly. That's about all I have. I don't know. So, did you start with like, did one of those ideas like become your first idea that you built around, or because you have so many images in there? Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So, the BFW out of New Richmond, Wendy Burnett, I believe is her name, um, she sends a question, and the question was, What does the American flag mean to me? So I had every eighth grader just write up a journal entry. I think it was eight sentences that I forced them to write. You have more than eight here. And then hers became <laughs> this beautiful essay because it was so, it was so eloquent that I just I, I encouraged her to make it into an essay yeah. for, for the bigger contest. Neat. Very cool. Very cool. Well, congratulations, and thank, uh, thank you for the presentation. We truly appreciate it. Were you more nervous for the Veterans Day program speech or for this one? <laughs> or you weren't nervous for either one? <laughs> I don't know. Each time was a little different. <laughs> like, that was yeah. a long time ago already, actually, right? True. Uh, yeah. But Henry's yeah. next. Great job. Right? <laughs> no, Mom just told me I got ice cream if I came to this meeting and sat quiet. <laughs> Great job. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Buckle. Thanks, yes. Mrs. Buckle. Thanks, Charlie. Thanks, There's more fun and excitement. <laughs> Stay warm. Okay, that was an excellent presentation. Um, just a, a little, a few more tidbits about Clara's. Um, Claire's also a GT student. Claire is, um, she's taking algebra and geometry right now at the high school. So she's sitting Eighth there. Grade. Yeah. And student council president. Student council president, yeah. In Very band. Cool. What's that? Is she in band? Oh, yeah. She, uh, There's the she plays, uh, <laughs> she, she, she had some type of award with her instrument. She did something pretty special. I can't remember what it was, so. She was recognized as fall already. So, yeah, too bad she doesn't have much going for her. <laughs> <laughs> Smart kid. Yeah, great kid. Talented. Yeah. Okay. And we'll move on to the next item, which is a report from the WASB State Education Convention in Milwaukee. So, who wants to start? Uh, Yes, I can. Um, you know, uh, heard three keynote speakers. Steve Pemberton, um, incredibly successful businessman. I can't remember which company he owns and has his hands on, but it's many, many. But he was uh, uh, in foster care his whole developmental life and um, shared his story. It uh, was very traumatic, obviously, but um, had a great message just of, of hope and the importance of having you know that um, influential person in their lives everybody that is successful has at least one caring and influential person so it's just a great message reinforcing what we do and why we do it um, Michelle Borba uh, was another keynote speaker um, and then Tessa Shu uh, went to the breakfast um, presentation she put on obviously Tessa's been to our school district before um, I have not seen her 
present, so it was a great opportunity to, to hear her message. She's from Ellsworth and um, was in a production of uh, Wizard of Oz. We felt the trap door. Ellsworth didn't have their own theater, so they were using the one in Red Wing. And it fell through a trap door and um, was uh, paralyzed there, fractured the neck. But she's got a great, again, message of hope. And I didn't know this about her presentation, but she closed with. Uh, singing someone over the rainbow oh my goodness unbelievable voice that was a great way to close um, incredible talent so good message um some sessions i went to one um admin team is currently just in the very initial stages of exploring a, a year-round calendar and seeing the pros and cons and what it could possibly present and um, the benefits of it and drawbacks um so Thomas school district did a nice presentation there are elementary schools only that are doing it uh, in that area, um, La Crosse has a few in Toma. There are um, different districts in some um, Montessori and or charter schools in Milwaukee, high schools included, that do it as well. So um, we have folks that we could, you know, obviously learn a lot from. So um, got a connection there. Um, the Happiness Advantage is another neat presentation, the superintendent of the year um, from North Fond du Lac. He did a presentation along with Don Hack from Spring Valley and um, Shelly Severson from Black River Falls did a joint presentation on the Happiness Project um, and the Orange Frog, um, but it ties very closely into employee engagement. You know, happiness, satisfaction, and engagement are different things, but they're close cousins. So there's some neat strategies that they have that I'm uh, interested in learning more about to fold in uh, to our, our district priorities of culture, climate, and engagement. And then lastly, John Forrester, the SAA, did his uh, most recent update on the Blue Ribbon Commission and the funding and legislative action coming up. I left that at home. Um, I don't have that, but I can do a future report on that. Um, a lot of it is speculation at this point. I mean, the legislative session is just starting. Um, but one of the things that jumped out at me right away, because one of my messages to, the, to our local legislators is to um, whatever you do, please try to pass this budget as quickly as possible, right? We're doing staffing and, you know, it's it's just a wish list at this point. We have no idea if we can fund one or all 14. And it's frustrating when it ends up being July when we're trying to hire people, you know, and the best windows in the spring. But he did say <laughs> most likely we'll be late and he threw out, which wasn't even on my radar, the month October. So, yeah, right. So that is scary. Um, so hopefully he's wrong on that. So again, uh, it's all speculation at this point. Anything there? Um, yeah, my first opportunity to go to this conference. And outstanding. Great to spend time with Howard and Tim. Um, just to grow our relationships, but also every, every besides Steve Pemberton, who Tim spoke to, who, um, if you want to learn more about him, both a book and a movie have come out, A Chance, um, a chance in the World is what it is. And I bought the book to do it as a nighttime read with my third grade book daughter. I just think that can really hit home in terms of being grateful and thankful, um, but then also how to, uh, to understand how other people may have it and, and grow that empathy piece as well. That title came from his, some adult comment that yeah. said, this kid doesn't have a chance yeah. in the world, you know, right. and, which is, Yep. Yeah, circled. Yeah. It's okay that yeah. 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 Um, and the individual sessions I went to were all uh, continue with the theme of equity. Um, every everything in the state of Wisconsin has certainly been pushing, maybe not brand new, but for a few years. But more of an emphasis now as part of the ESSA plan um, from a federal level is to close the gap. And Wisconsin has one of the worst gaps um, in the nation um, with students of color uh, specifically. So uh, every, every session has a theme of building equity with whether it's the curriculum, the materials used, uh, uh, the, the path created for students going to four year, two year, right in the workforce. Uh, so it, I don't think anybody can argue against that theme. It can, it, I mean, it fits right with tonight, right? Not only our gap of uh, um, subgroups of students with disabilities or um, EL students, uh, poverty, economically disadvantaged but also those that are gifted and talented and how are we serving them so it fits right in line with it but wonderful wonderful districts uh, 
and individuals speaking and great networking opportunities to connect uh, with people from the past or brand new and uh, exchange numbers and looking forward to connect with how they're doing things in their districts and what might translate into ours. It's great. Okay. And, you know, as Nick says, it's always a great opportunity to network with other districts across the state. Had some opportunities to do that. Also went to the delegate convention uh, on Wednesday afternoon, which was a long, drawn-out affair. <laughs> Those that haven't participated in that, I would welcome them. For Sorry, I missed opportunity. it. <laughs> <laughs> this is part of your... I know. <laughs> Jeff, oh, Jeff, there's a little sarcasm. You think? <laughs> uh, for the most part, the uh, resolutions that were put forth uh, by the Policies and Resolutions Committee passed as is, uh, with the exception of the student poverty and revenue limits, which was amended and passed, and I did not get an opportunity to write down what that amendment was, but it was essentially uh, putting more specific detail uh, in what constitutes the uh, equalization aid. I think they added also categorical aids uh, in that. Um, and then the other one that was amended was one on child care. Um, the most hotly debated um, resolution uh, was a revolution, or resolution 16 with regards to school safety. Um, there were things that were added, removed, amended, removed again, um, debates were closed, discussion continued. Um, it was amended, I don't know how many times, but uh, in the end, the only amendment that passed was changing uh, wording, which states uh, legislation allowing prosecutors to bring felony charges was changed to appropriate charges against any individual who intentionally conveys a threat or false information concerning it. an attempt uh, to use a dangerous weapon to injure or kill a person on school property. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. So uh, the de debate, uh, I guess, just shows the diversity across the state uh, with the various uh, concerns of individual school districts. And uh, some didn't believe that the wording was strict enough. Other ones thought it was too strict. And in the end. The consensus of the body was that we are not in the business of telling prosecutors which laws that they should prosecute uh, those individuals uh, with and should be up to them to be uh, implementing the laws and not the school district when it comes to criminal uh, penalties. So. That was a consensus of the body in the end. So, with that, I talked to different districts, uh, Amory, uh, some fellows there, talked with some of our colleagues from Unity, uh, superintendent from Prentice, a board member from Toma. So, uh, all of them uh, were all in the same boat. We all have the same problems, same opportunities. So, but it's always interesting to talk to our colleagues and uh, see where we're at. So it was it was a good convention. I uh, appreciate it again. So, I'll Governor, again. speak. I don't. Uh, he was supposed to. We uh, we left that the, the very last two hours was where he was slated for the <clears throat> keynote. So. Um, we had to leave early to get back. I didn't stick around for it either, but he did have his state of the state address.
laid out his panel, which is up for quite a debate, I think, in Madison right now with the Assembly and Senate <clears throat> versus the governor. So we'll see what happens. Now, the SAA and the governor's budget you know, aligned, at least, good thing. Okay, are there any questions? Other questions on the state? Hearing none, we will move on to the next item, which is our first meeting of our comprehensive communication policy and plan uh, committee. So uh, <clears throat> we just met the hour before this meeting, and on the committee is uh, Trish, Kirk, myself, and Tim was also at the meeting. Um, we, we talked about purpose, scope, desired outcome, and some of the key drivers and filters. Um, specifically, we discussed, are we looking for policy or plan, and how would I see that you have it listed? And as we discussed, um, you know, there's some things that we think are already in place. For example, building and principal communications are in place. Uh, we may need to be a little more formal, like in designating a district spokesperson, although when there's been an incident, you know, Tim or Howard have uh, been those pro tem. So um, from a policies perspective, we were less excited about perhaps this big formal policy like some other districts have. We'll catch those pieces we need, but what is the plan that we can, um, as a board, communicate with the community? And so, because um, there's some other really good things already going on, so let's let's just leave those going. Speaking of communications, <laughs> um, this is the new board ringtone, and it will be sent out to all your phones uh, beginning tomorrow. Um, and so, really, where we're at next is um, some discovery. Um, what are the communications that go out now so that we can check for what gaps are? What are all the functions that we have available or formats that we have available to us, both uh, online and um, verbal and paper? Um, we did talk quite a bit about, Jeff, your idea about, you know, a district mailing on a routine basis. And one of the ideas that we were building around on that is have it be a proactive communication. So instead of reporting 10 good things that already happened, oh, too bad you missed it. Here's here's 10 things that are coming up that um, can engage different folks of the community at different levels, whether it's a volunteer opportunity, that FBLA tournament that's coming up. Uh, maybe, you know, not just necessarily all the, the uh, uh, sports schedules and the concert schedules, give them access to it, but what, what's 10 unique things that are coming up in the district uh, to keep engaging people in those opportunities. <coughs> Again, this is about creating um, engagement between the board and the community and replacing that perception that the only time you ever talk to us, there's a referendum attached to it six months later. So um, <coughs> we'll do some more of that discovery at the next meeting. Um, Tim, I think we agreed that we will do this uh, communication meeting at the regular the Board third meeting. the third Monday of each month before the regular board meeting yep. at uh, the hour before so 6 p.m. and so wage and benefit would be before board and learning so we don't um, crisscross on those so um, you know we're certainly open to uh, input and feedback we've set up <coughs> a, uh, a group document as a committee it's open I haven't shared with anybody, but uh, we, we we're doing that mostly for convenience right now so that we can have a single point of input. Okay. I guess I'd ask the committee then, is there anything else that uh, you need from me or any other board members to assist you or? Um, you know, we're always open to ideas, thoughts, comments. Um, so as we continue, I think it would help if we get a chance to continue to report out, Howard, and I think we'll just have to think what are specific questions or feedback that we would be looking for, but um, unless you're going to come and say, no, we really need this committee to write a formal policy, we'd rather be geared for action at how do we engage.
proactively with our community with all the good things that are going on. Okay. Now, I really appreciate your hard work. Magnificent uh, outcome, and uh, I look forward to it. Because, uh, you three are a lot better at communication sometimes than I am. So. Well, I, think, I think the the biggest thing that we're trying to do is we have a population of people in our district that don't have kids in our district, and they're the ones that the perception is the only time you talk to us, the only time you give us any information is when you want money from us. So instead of saying, we want money for you, we want to start saying, this is what your money is doing. Come check us out. Come check us out. And, You're invited. And when we talk about 10 things happening in the district, key in on some of the smaller things that are going on too. The robotics club. Um, what's FFA doing? What's FBLE doing? What's forensics doing? Not just what the school, the football team, or the basketball team, or the volleyball team will do. The big concerts. Yeah, the big, the big band concerts. Get some of those smaller things in it so that we're not repeating the same 10 things every month. And I like, I really liked John's idea about calling it the top 10 list because it keys in with our goal to become a top 10 school district. And it carries a theme through with that. And that's, you know, our purpose is like you said, not to come up with a policy for it, but to look at what we're doing, see what's going on, see where we might be missing pieces, fill in those gaps, and then look for redundancy in format. So are we mailing out the same information multiple times? And maybe change that to redundancy in different formats. So there's a piece of information that's getting mailed, there's a piece of information that's going out electronic media, there's a piece of information that's coming across our scoreboards at the at the sporting events. I'm trying to just trying to figure out what what we're doing great and what we need to tweak. Comments, Trish? One of, one of the things that I keep hearing comments on that would be fantastic opportunity for communications would be maybe getting some student-led uh, messaging mm -hmm. on our video boards. Yeah, I brought that up. Yeah. Excellent. So look forward to progress and uh, your next report. So thank you for your work. Okay, uh, moving on to the next item. Uh, School level budget report uh, by Jen Kleschel, business manager. So, when the federal government passed the ESSA Act, Every Student Succeeds Act, that included some new requirements on how the states provide financial information to the U.S. Department of Education. So, in order for the state to get the information in the manner that they need it for reporting to the federal government, they had to pass down those requirements to all the school districts. So this year, for the first time, we had to complete a school level budget report. And we will also have a school level annual report once this fiscal year is complete. So what that means is we have to report all of our financial information by school. So just like we are, um, we have our district report cards. Each school has a report card. Now each school will have a financial report as well. So in your packet, you have a copy of our um, school level budget report that was submitted back in December. And so what we needed to do was split it into basically three categories and a couple subcategories. So we have all of our expenditures that we were able to separate out by school level. So for example, our teachers that are at the elementary school got coded to the elementary school. The teachers that are at the middle school got coded to the middle school. Teachers at the high school got coded to the high school. So we were able to separate them out. 
Then we have the expenditures that you can't really separate out by school. So it's a district-wide expense, like transportation, for example. So we don't separate out or just put elementary students on one bus and track that. You know, all the students ride all the different buses and it's intermingled. So that would be a district expense. And each of those two categories then are broken down by, did we use federal dollars to pay for that expense? Or did we use state or local dollars? So basically your federal dollars are any federal funds that we receive. So mostly your Title I, Title II, those types of things. So the federal expenditures are pretty low in each category in comparison to what the state and local are. So the third category are the exclusions. And DPI gave us a list of what those exclusions are. Um, things like debt service, the food service program, community ed, uh, Fund 72, which is our scholarships. Those aren't directly related to student instruction. So they said you can exclude these certain list of items. So when you look at the report, you can see that we have just the very first page is kind of the best summary. So in the first four columns, you have your school expenditures. You have your enrollment for each building, the federal per pupil expenditures, state and local, and then the total for each per pupil in that building. So this goes by head count, not our actual third Friday count. So the, the difference between all those open enrolled in kids mostly. Then the district expenditures you can see are the same for each building because again, they're taking all those district expenses and just dividing them out by how many students are in that building. So, but the per student amount is the same. And then they're excluding those expense or those exclusions. So then you have your total district expenditures at the end. Now remember in the total expenditures, that does include all those debt service payments and the food service program and the scholarships and all that. What's the difference between school expenditure versus district expenditure? So it's specifically spent in the school or it's spent at a district level and allocated to oh. each school? Right. Like busing because we have right. mixed okay. use on that. The bigger question is how does this help us educate students better? Yeah, I guess my question to Jen is what is what is the purpose of it? I guess would be my question. Are they at the federal level deciding that each student needs to be given equity in the amount of funding in each building even though Cost of education at different different levels of different costs. I haven't heard that. I think it's more on a national level that they want to be able to compare how much it costs to educate an elementary school student in California compared to Wisconsin compared to New York. I think it's more as a whole and they want to make sure that all the information that they're receiving is being reported in the same manner. So that's why they were very specific about like what is an exclusion. They want to make sure that everyone's reporting in the same way. And DPI worked with, gosh, I want to say it was more than, that's not on there, but it was like 30 different states and they all work together on trying to come up with, you know, how are, what are exclusions going to be and what are, how are we reporting this and, and everything. So I think it's the bigger picture, not necessarily that they're gonna pinpoint and say we need to spend a certain amount per student, but for this- just trying to make sure it's apples and apples across the country. Yeah. yeah. So for this year and next year, we will have an additional 
budget report, um, the school level budget report, and the school level annual report. And then three years from now, we are supposed to have it all combined. So we won't have to report in the manner that we were before, but it'll be all combined then. So for a couple years, but this information is out there for the public to see. So they can go out on the DPI website and they can see this information. And that's the main reason why I wanted to bring it to your attention. Okay. Because um, if you were to get questions. You probably already answered it, but I'm gonna ask it again. Um, mm -hmm. In your uh, explanation of uh, lines G, H, and I, what do those stand for? So column, so at the very top, you have your school expenditures, mm -hmm. and then you have your district expenditures and your totals. So under A, column A is your enrollment, and then B, C, and D kind of go together because you have your school expenditures that mm -hmm. are your federal dollars, your state, state and local dollars. dollars, and then your total. Mm -hmm. So it's the same under the district expenditures. Okay. Except because they're district expenditures, it's the same amount per pupil. That's why you don't see any differences there. Okay. They're taking that total amount of district expenditures and mm -hmm. dividing it by the number of students, and that's your per pupil cost. Okay. Okay, and so the district... Uh, Okay, so really column, only... column, column G is, what does that stand for? District expenditures. Okay, that's, that's your total district expenditures per pupil. Okay. So for each student that is here, we pay $1,936, okay. or that's what we're budgeting for this year for that student in okay. district costs. Costs okay. that we can't allocate to a certain level Grade level or okay. it's just certain students. It's just the sum of it. Okay. 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 And then column H is your total of your school expenditures, which is column D mm -hmm. and column G. And okay. those are different based on mm -hmm. if they're in high school, middle school, elementary, or yeah. virtual. Mm -hmm. Okay. That helps clarify it. I was looking at the sheet behind it. And, uh, broken out in uh, lines and columns. So, okay, I think I understand it now. So, okay. How, how many extra hours of work is this now? More reports. Of course, in the first year, it's always more because you have to learn. Um, I probably had about two weeks worth of time in this between the training and going through everything to figure out. We had a lot of the expenditure codes set up already by building, but we had quite a bit few things that weren't that still could be. So now so. that it's set up, Jen, is it systemic that it quote-unquote self-sorts, or is there manual effort that you know, it may not be a one-to-one -one ratio, but is there ongoing additional resource hours that need to be attributed to this, or do you set it and now the system sorts it for you? Now that I have it set up, it should be minimal. Um, I can see when we add new accounts um, if, because we usually a couple times a year we end up adding additional accounts, then I'm going to have to go in and allocate those as what level, you know, are they a school level, are they a district level, are they state and local, are they federal, where do they fit in the pie? And then I'll have to adjust my reporting based on that. I'm just but it should be fairly, how much impact there is. So, okay. It should be fairly minimal going forward. Right. Thank but you. most of it was up front to just to learn what we how Have we to needed do. to report. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions? 
Thank you, Jenny, for your report. Okay. Next item on our financial reports. And we will start with our treasurer's report. And since our treasurer is not here, I will go over the report. Okay. Bank account balances as of December 31st, 2018. Citizens Bank checking was $90,000. $344.37. Citizen State Money Market, $1,507,726.36. Citizen State Bank Money Market Fund 46 is $51.41. Citizen State Money Market Suicide Prevention is $17,985.97. American Deposit Management Referendum Proceeds, uh, $195,392.67 for total bank account balances of $1,811,500.78. Move to accept as presented. Second. Our motion, David. Second, Kirk, to accept the Treasurer's report as presented. Any further discussion? <coughs> All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next is consideration of our consent agenda, which consists of approval of meeting, uh, meeting minutes of our Wage and Benefit Committee meeting of December 10th, 2018, our SCC board meeting of December 10th, 2018, approval of bi monthly bills for January 2019, approval of resignations and retirements, Amanda Langman is our head dance coach, approval of appointments and contract modifications, Jessica Parsons from full-time to half-time first grade teacher, and Corey Mulholland, our JV baseball coach, and approval of curricular modifications for students enrolled in full-time and part-time virtual ed courses, which consists of 27 part-time students. So. And uh, I'd like to comment on uh, 10D1, Jessica Parsons from 1FT to half-time. Um, might be wondering, it's a unique situation. She's interested in doing a job share like we currently do um, with Mrs. Tackman and Mrs. Bean in fifth grade. Um, so they're having their first baby this spring, and she'd like to, you know, balance that, uh, being half-time teacher. And, uh, and allows her more time at home. Um, so again, the board developed this contract many years ago, um, and so it, it's uh, signed and evaluated on an annual basis. Um, but the first step would be to prove this before we could post um, for the other half-time job. Of course, it does not cost the district any more money. That's right in the contract, those stipulations. So, um, okay. Do I have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So we'll Okay, I have a motion, David, second, Jeff, approve the consent agenda as presented. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay. What if I send these around that way? We go sign. Okay. Uh, the next item on the agenda is our student enrollment update. Um, because of the, the timing of the board meeting in December, that, you know, we didn't have one last month, but um, I'll just refer to this month because it has this month's and last month's on it. Um, again, in January, 1,614 students in seats in the buildings. Um, we are up 16 students, which is um, higher than average, um, close to the last trend, the last five years or so. So that's a really good thing. I think we had uh, nine new students just in January at the elementary alone, if I remember right. Um, also, our free reduced lunch rate stays uh, below 20%, currently at 18.16. Um, our virtual full-time resident students are 21 and 124 virtual charter for a total of 145 virtual students and stuff overseas. <coughs> And um, we also, as you can see, as compared to this time last year for our virtual charter, we were at 76, we're at 124. This year up 48 uh, compared to a year ago. 
the last thing I want to point out is open enrollment. You know, uh, I know it's a good thing. I think we all know that it's a good thing that um, about three years ago we turned a corner and have more students coming in than going out. Largely, a large part of that is our charter school, but not just that. Um, you know, it, it speaks to our, our school being a destination school, but didn't really um, understand where uh, everyone else was kind of at. You know, I mean, everybody's different, but, you know, one of our presentations I sat in, they were so proud of getting their ratio um, uh, of uh, out to in down to 2.1. So they, they were like so happy that only, you know, only twice as many people are going out as coming in. They, they were celebrating that their ratios were four point something just a few years ago and four times as many going out as coming in and, um, and these are the districts that were presenting you know on, on great things they're doing so again another advantage of all those conferences to put things in perspective um, we on the other hand are 2.1 percent you know to the positive we have two we have twice as many students coming in than, than leaving us so I just thought I would make note of that Questions for Tim on student enrollment? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Tim. Uh, move on to the next item, which is our uh, student, staff, and community recognition. Uh, we have four this month. To uh, Hudson Machine and Tool Company, a thank you. Our district would like to thank you for your assistance with many projects you have helped with in the past. Recently, you helped repair the wiper motor for our John Deere Tractor, we certainly appreciate your willingness to take your time and expertise to help us. A thank you to Chief Aaron McWilliams. Thank you for your continued support of our staff, students, and families. You go above and beyond to build relationships with kids and your presence and efforts do not go unnoticed. Um, Chief McWilliams is with the Roberts Police Department. Uh, to Greg Burton. Thank you for volunteering at the middle school as a mentor. Your effort is making a big difference with the young men in our building. Pete, is that our next door neighbor? Yeah. And then to Claire Frankowitz, uh, congratulations to Claire on achieving the Girl Scout Gold Award. So we have a, a gold award recipient to district. So those are the recognitions for the board for this month. Everybody's had a chance to sign them all in. I don't see them yet. I don't see them yet. I gave them to in the file with Jen. I'm sorry. That's my fault. I signed a whole bunch of stuff. I just got okay. So there's user error and then there's clerk error? Or? I, think, I think we're down one card too, so we will take we care of that. Okay, um, and with, with that, we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is consideration of the administrative contract extensions for the 2021 school year. There were three. Did you say there were four? Yeah, um, we're missing one because we are uh, out of the uh, card stock. Out of the cards. Okay. We'll uh, sign up board learning. Yeah, we'll get that signed later. Okay. Um, we um, were notified last month of the administrator's automatic contract extensions, uh, essentially the rollover uh, clause in their contract. Uh, typically in January we do a, a formal motion um, as far as extending those contracts. So I don't know if there's any questions, comments. You want us to say, Tim? Nope. Um, just recommending that they all be rolled over for the 2021 20, school year. Okay. Second. We have a motion, Jeff. Second, John, to extend the contract of our administrators for the 2021 school year. Any further discussion? Okay. Uh, hearing none. All those in favor of the motion on the floor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 
Motion carries. Okay, next item on the agenda, the number of spaces available for special education students for open enrollment purposes for the 2019-20 school year. So I told the administrative team tonight's meeting was optional. There wasn't anything specifically I didn't present or speak to, except Pat, I, you know, she lives in Eau Claire. I gave her the option to do a phone, phone conference and be available. Um, I don't anticipate um, a ton of conversation, but I wanted to make her available. So is that all right if I just dial her up here and get her on the speaker? Yes. Yeah. Sure. All right. <laughs> I need a dog one. We're sorry, your call cannot be completed as dialed. She kept those kids here a little longer. <laughs> Text her to dial us. I'll call in. Well, we can proceed to the next one. I'll start with that one. Okay. Um, Regular education. Okay, then we will move on to the next item on the agenda, which is determining the number of spaces available for regular education students for open enrollment purposes for the 2019 20 school year. All right, we are recommending. Um, that uh, not limiting the number of spaces available for regular, regular education students for open enrollment for the 1920 school year. Okay, do we need a formal motion on that? We do. Okay. Do we have a motion? Move to accept as presented. Second. Okay, I have a motion, John, second, David, to accept um, the recommendation on uh, open enrollment for regular education. So if someone applies to our district and it's regular ed, we have to accept that? Correct. Okay. Yep. So if we have whatever, 10 more second graders that want to open enrollment and it means that we're going to increase our classroom size and we need a whatever seventh session of second grade, we still have to accept them? Yes. Well, are there any class, I, I, I think it's, we dependent can, it's different on the staff ed. that we currently have available. So we don't have to hire additional staff, but if we have two spaces in a second grade classroom, then we have to allow those two to be filled. Yeah, that's right. And we can recommend that they go through the virtual school, you know, if they, if they yes. don't have the space. That's right. Okay. Yeah, I just get confused on this every year yeah. when we say unlimited, because that changed a couple of years ago, this wording. 
And I just want to make sure that we don't get ourselves in a situation where, you know, we don't have, you know, we end up with a 28 to 1 ratio in the classroom. Yeah. Chances are they're going to come in as a 6 going into that, that big one. Right. Yeah. Okay. So there's yeah. a motion and a second. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Any further discussion? Okay. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Mm -hmm. Motion carries. Okay, we're still waiting on Yeah, we can, um, if you wanted to go to the next, I mean, okay. I, is just go ahead, tell us what she's recommending. Yeah, it's it's the same thing, not Unlimited. limiting uh, seats for open enrollment, and um, again, we have the, the, uh, the governor, the safeguard that, you know, we're able to look at each individual IP, and if we're not <coughs> able to accommodate their needs, we are able to deny. What's the financial model on special ed now? It used to be, oh, how much per, per they, student? They did an IEP, and you know, if it was sixty thousand dollars, the home district would have to pay sixty thousand dollars to the other. But it's different now. What is yeah, it? Yeah, it's a flat like twelve thousand five hundred dollars somewhere around there um, for each special ed student. So a little bit more than those regular ed students. And the home district pays us. Not all of that twelve thousand, or we get the whole twelve thousand. We get the whole twelve thousand. And if the cost of services exceed that, we get the twelve thousand. <laughs> so is that what you look at when you when you see there? But if we don't have the capability to serve them, we can say no. Correct. It it all gets filed under the reasonable accommodation language. So if the cost to the cost to educate that student in our district is not reasonable. We have the option to turn it down. And we have we done that with our virtual charter. We've done it already. Uh -huh. Now they're asking for accommodations that we can't provide through virtual education. Right. It's denied. And do we have a sense? So like 15% of our population has an IEP. What percentage of open enroll students have IEPs? I, I don't know off the top of my head. Higher. So if they have no, an IEP, no. is open enroll and is IEP and special ed the same? So if a kid comes to us and has an IEP, is he special, special ed? Correct. Yes. A regular ed student can have a 504. Other I mean, of the 124 <laughs> students we have, I mean, it's just started this year. I'm, you know, I sign each one, but I it just ballparking it. I, I think it's 15 or less. So um, it's not. So not okay. yeah, but that's twelve percent. Yeah. So it's increasing. It is increasing. I anticipate it increasing, especially as word gets out. You know, because um, it's not as common. I think for virtual charter school to accept special education <laughs> students more are are limiting seats. I think more school districts. Period. Than than that, but. Mm. In our case, that's the, the, the number one reason, really, uh, is our virtual charter school. If we were to limit seats, it really um, prohibits us from accepting those students in, from January to, to um, July 1st, even though they did change it a little bit by grade level. Um, it's just, we're willing, uh, you know, we've done it for a year now, and it's worked well, so we're willing to, to do it for another year. Okay. Okay. okay so, do I have so motion. Second. I have a motion, John, second, Kirk, to accept the recommendation uh, open enrollment for our special education students for 2019 20 school year. Okay, any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, next item on the agenda is our update on our long-term capital improvement plan. So you should have handout 13D in front of you. There were very few changes from last year. So the first change is actually on the top of the second page. We did replace some carpeting out at the high school in uh, six different rooms. So I have updated those. 
we also replaced the um, kitchen receiving area sidewalk at the high school. So I've updated the year on that and the amount for replacement in 2033. On the third page, it's my understanding that the middle school ball field upgrades have been completed. So I removed that. And then on the final page, the same thing with the middle school conference room. So those were the changes. Otherwise, everything is the same as last year. And I did update the cost by year as well. So you can see it kind of spills off into the top of that fourth page there. But we're looking at about $9.8 million worth of projects. And we need to have this in place because of our fund 46, which has $51.41. I move to approve. Okay, do I have a second? So we'll call her second. Okay. Uh, we have our update. We have a motion to accept the update. Any further discussion? All those in favor, the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Next item is discussion regarding uh, forming a Food Service Bid Committee. So. so every five years, we are required to go out for bids for the food service program. So 1920 school year, it will be the first year of the new contract. So we released our RFP on January 14th, so just a couple weeks ago. And those proposals are due back from the vendors on February 26th. We have to have our evaluation complete by March 18th. And then it will be presented to the board for approval at the April regular board meeting. So I need a committee to go through all the proposals from the vendors between February 26th and March 18th. You basically do it in one meeting? I'm anticipating one meeting. Okay. Unless for some reason we would have a lot of bids. Because you get a lot of wage and benefits out of it. Yeah. So you're already. So I'm so good at waiting through proposals though. Yeah, last time we had Jeff, Kirk, and David. I'm happy to do it again. Okay. You're going to be incapacitated. Okay. Uh, well, it depends on when we meet. I can't. Have, I can't always have Joe was, drop me off. I, just, I might not be able to drive a vehicle during that time. I'm just let me drive. Okay. Because it's my right. It's my right knee. I don't know if I can hit a gas pedal or get to the brakes. Okay. I. Would you do it during the daytime? Whenever we can meet is fine. I'm willing to stay late or whatever we need to do. Okay. How much time does it take? You know, usually we have two to three proposals. A couple of hours. Uh, yeah, yeah two of hours max. You can do it again, if, as long as we would hopefully push it towards later after the Liberty Okay, that's that fine. Depends on the day as well. But the week of March 4th through the 8th, that week is a pretty good week for them. Okay. Have to be approved by Monday that week. So. Um... The 18th. I'll be probably at the, hopefully the end of my recovery on the That's a good week. If we need evening or whatever, I can, I can do that. Yeah. Okay. And if we need another body that uh, somebody can't show up, I can. I, I thought I heard Scott volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> Should I put you down, Dave, or? Uh, what date are we talking about? March 4th. Or 4th we you have want to set learning. a specific date? So we'll have wage and benefit. Yeah, so wage and benefit. It's Tuesday, what, what do you got? Yep. What about the 5th? What date? 
what night of the week is that? Tuesday. Tuesday. Okay, so Tuesday the 5th? Mm -hmm. Does that work for you, Tricia? Probably. I schedule this part up. But, but then yeah, talk about 6 o'clock? 6 o'clock? 6 p.m.? Okay, so, so okay. who do we have on the committee then? Those three. I don't know. Okay. Jeff, Trisha, and David. Okay. March 5th at 6 p.m. Okay. I'll send out a calendar invite. Okay, please do, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Great. Great, thank you. What's well, her reason no one does it? There's free food. Three samples. <laughs> they bring free food. Samples. So they're not canceling that, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. Stepping forward on that. Okay, the next item on the agenda is approval of adding a Fund 60 German Club and a Fund 60 Strength and Conditioning Activity Club. Yep, the German Club, so last in August, um, I sat down with Tim Scott and the Germans from Germany. Uh, they came over and they were obscure at the end of their trip, so I got to meet them at Perkins in Menominee. Yeah. Um, Tim decided that the connection with scouting was not going well um, and wanted to find a way to make it more sustainable. Um, I proposed the school being supportive of the German program by hiring Ariana, uh, that the school get more involved, if not take over that program um, as far as the exchange portion goes for our kids. Um, there's a proposal to the Germans and the Germans have yet to respond. Um, so Ariana wants to start fundraising to do something different uh, with her German kids. So she wants to open up a Fund 60 so that way she can start making money to do her own stuff. Um, I'm gonna meet with her and uh, Jacob Spade uh, sometime in the next coming weeks to discuss wherever we're at uh, with that exchange thing see how we can keep moving forward with um, that for our kids. Um, so that's the reason for the German Fund 60. Um, the Strength and Conditioning Fund 60, uh, we have uh, started Panther Power Lifting. Um, I've taken that on in my budget. Uh, we have 15 uh, students that are participating, or athletes that are participating. Um, what they do is they go and perform at meets around the area. Uh, there's regional meets that they can qualify for state. Four of our athletes have already qualified for state, uh, including a freshman who won the Osceola meet at his weight class. Um, and there's more regional competitions to come. Um, so the Fund 60 is to help our strength and conditioning program 612, but also help fund and offset the cost for Panther powerlifting. I've been, I've been surprised that there are many, as many schools participating. Oh, it's huge. It's, it's catching on It's getting bigger. Yeah. Yeah. So we're looking to go in there. We're already taking a bunch. So uh, this is like when we set up the internal band or the internal booster fund for these. So then they'll do their concessions or <laughs> meat raffles, but those dollars need a place to reside and we need more to action on it Correct. as of yes. a couple years ago, right? Yeah. Yeah. And Jen and I discussed. You know, we have the, the booster cup that I have, so the SEC Athletics Booster. Um, but after discussion with Jen, it's, it's easier to keep things separate instead yeah. of putting all in one pot. Otherwise, I can't keep track of all the budgets I have to end that. So yeah. um, they already have some meat raffles planned um, to help with some of these regional and state costs. Um, there's a lot of equipment that goes with it too. You know, weightlifting, required weightlifting belts, getting our coaches certified to be on the floor. Um, just fees alone for, for going to the competitions. So, and then, do we have coaches <coughs> coming in and volunteering, or is it district employees that are now being coaches? Both. Yeah, no, they're district employees. So um, Ryan Bird, who is a winter strength conditioning coach, is one of the powerlifting coaches, um, and Adam Sheldon are here together. Adam Sheldon's a one of the special ed teachers at the high school. Okay. They're both coaching and have gotten their certifications and are taking kids on Saturdays to go to these competitions. Uh, 
how many so, boys, how many girls are participating? Um, it's about, I think there's 10 boys and five girls. Um, there were three girls that were very close to qualifying for state. Um, and there were four other boys that were close in their weight classes for qualifying. So this is just to open the funds. It's not to pay for a coach or anything designated yet. It's open the funds. Sure. Yep. So moved. It's just a second. Okay, I have a motion from John, second Jeff, to authorize uh, creation of Fund 60 German Club and a Fund 60 Strength and Conditioning Activity Fund. Any further discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. Okay, at this time, do we have any other business coming up? Okay, hearing none, uh, go over the important dates coming up uh, next week. February 4th, we have a Wage and Benefit Committee meeting at 5.30. The district office, we also have our board learning special meeting at 6.30 at the district office. February 18th, we have our regularly scheduled uh, school board meeting at 7 p.m. at the district office. And we also have listed uh, March 26th, our CESA Joint uh, Board of Control <coughs> PAC meeting scheduled for 6 p.m. at Turtle Lake. <coughs> Any other dates that we're missing? Yes, for February 18th, 2019 at 6 p.m. Uh, communications committee meeting. Okay. Any other dates? The, the one we just scheduled, right? Uh, March 5th okay. for the uh, uh, food service okay. proposal review. What, do we, what happens at the CISA meeting? Uh, we have a speak, we have a speaker coming in. Um, on, uh, what is it? What's it? Uh, Written here, it's on service. Uh, it's the guy that was fired from the Timberwolves, Tom Thibodeau. Like not, same name, different guy. Different guy. Oh, <laughs> so a, well, that'd be interesting. The, the speaker, <laughs> speaker is uh, from Viterbo University, <laughs> and it's well, a talk on Jordan servant leader. <laughs> so. He's outstanding, if I may interject. Him. Really, Tom Thibodeau from yeah. Viterbo had some classes where he was a teacher. Yeah. Very okay. engaging. You would, you will enjoy him. If you're able to I'd like to <clears throat> throw a, a big date out there for you guys on February twenty seventh. Um, we are going to be hosting um, the Top Secret Project, it's called. It, uh, it's facilitated through um, Hazelden and the Betty Ford Association. Um, it's going to be a big, it, I think, in regards to community relationships and communication. Um, we have the St. Croix County Sheriff, uh, local police, Patty Schachter is either going to be there or... Um, one of her delegates, or whoever worked for, um, we will be doing, um, we'll be setting up in the auditorium a bedroom that uh, that uh, Sheriff Knudsen and a group of people will give parents tours of the bedroom in regards to helping them find warning signs or typical things that a parent might not look for that they may see, um, and then they will present from 7 until 8.30. Um, so we're communicating that we're going to send it to Spring Valley, River Falls, all the neighboring school districts, and uh, all the local churches and so forth to try to get as many kids. And we're, we're giving free food, try to get as many people there. We're going to provide daycare. Um, so myself, Chris Jardine, Jeff Fern, and... Um, High school and middle school are working together to put this on. It's going to be a big deal. Thank you. Is there anything else? Uh, isn't there a fundraiser coming up at Trinity Lutheran for us for the suicide prevention? The pancake, uh, the, the waffle. Dad's waffles. Yep, Dad's waffles. Do you know what that date is? February 12th. I thought it was a March date. It's, March. it's on the sign. Uh, <laughs> no, March, uh, I think it's March 8th. I have it on my calendar. I think it's March 8th. Where is it at? It's, it's at the high school. Yeah. Okay. 
and just real quickly, because Greg is here. Um, on July 6th, 7th, and 8th, uh, the Colts Drum and Bugle Corps, and they have two drum corps. They have a world-class corps and an open-class corps. Um, they'll be competing on Sunday at uh, TCF Bank Stadium in Minneapolis. And they will be coming in on Saturday morning, rehearsing all day Saturday. They'll rehearse Sunday morning. They'll go to the show. They'll come back Sunday night and rehearse all day Monday. And they're ecstatic. And I just want to give a shout out to Greg. Already six weeks ago, he reached out to me and said, when are the drone corps coming? And re uh, made sure he knew so that he could arrange the floor waxing schedules for that. And to have two corps in town at both schools um, over 4th of July, Jason said, bring them in. We'll We'll, we'll be excited about it. We got, just, we got more showers going for Yeah, it, we, and, right? and the showers are fixing all that. So we'll figure out later on what we want to do as a community, but to have uh, two uh, well-run, you know, two cores from a well-run organization is a big deal. If you remember Dakota Coach, who was a young man in our district, he actually performed with the Colts for one season. So uh, he was uh, a, a rookie of the or the hardest working rookie award that year too. So, travel is together. Do they try to have both separate? But they are one organization administratively, and they are excited that they can be in one town, and they're actually going to do some things together. So, we're going to hook up with them and see what we can do uh, with some clinic or uh, community event, or get them both up at the high school one evening, so that now your neighbor your friend knows, or your friend who. Wanted to know why his backyard was noisy and pretty cool. They should blow the roof up for auditoriums. Yeah. Mm -hmm. They should do a concert in our auditorium. We've done concerts in auditoriums and it's actually really super cool. I know, it's really cool. Not too we loud. can talk about it. Oh no, there's, okay. you don't worry about it. not too loud. You just, you just, <laughs> there's no paint in the auditorium, so. Yeah. But that's coming up and it's a way out date, but Greg really made it happen. Or anything else. Evidently, I get to make an announcement of my my new job and job title as Kirk Witt, the vice president of 3M Company. <laughs> wow. All right. Congratulations. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, told you if you had a way to hard left. Yeah. <laughs> He's coming in and run this place. I'm out of here. <laughs> okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. You have a second? Yeah. Of course. Hi. 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 Okay. Thank you all. Drive safe, stay warm.